CataractCoach.com. I had an amazing podcast interview recently with Dr. Rizzo Naithani. She's a young aspiring ophthalmologist who's applying to residency program soon. And she has a website called Open Globe Talk. Let me show it to you. She has a podcast here. And her podcast, it's concerned with a lot of public health things, professional development as an ophthalmologist, residency training. It's really a fantastic program. And I really encourage you to check it out. It's openglobetk.com. All right. Welcome back to another episode of Open Globe Talk. This is your host, Rosanna Thani. And today we have an international expert in ocular surgery, ranked number one in Southern California, number three in the U.S. If you guessed it right, it is Dr. Ode Devgan. He specializes in cataract, refractive lens implant, and LASIK. He's a private practice surgeon at Devgan Eye Surgery in Los Angeles and a full partner at Specialty Surgical Center at Beverly Hills, California. He's also a clinical professor at Jules Stein Eye Institute, UCLA, and the Chief of Ophthalmology at Olive View UCLA Medical Center. He obtained his undergraduate at UCLA, uh, obtained his MD with highest distinction, summa cum laude, at the University of Southern California School of Medicine, and completed his ophthalmology residency at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, where he obtained Simpson Outstanding Achievement Award and Clinical Research Award, which are highly privileged awards given to one of the top resident trainees. You are too kind. So all this stuff sounds great on paper, but let me tell you, none of it's actually all that important. So and I think one of the things too, sometimes we get too stuck on, I've made this mistake myself is assuming that, you know, you need to go to one specific program or one specific school and train there as if that's going to make any difference in your life. And actually the truth is, It's the horse, not the track that wins the race. And a good horse can race on any track. And so does it really matter? You know, I think back to kids who are 12th grade and applying to, you know, college or university in the USA, and they don't get into their dream school because these days it's just so ridiculous and ultra competitive and people apply to dozens, if not a hundred programs and you don't go to your dream school and they think the world is over, but it doesn't actually make a difference. You know, whether I went to this school or the other for my training, I don't think it's going to really affect my outcome and what I'm doing now in life. And to be very frank, too, if you think about it, remember back in high school, you learned all these different things in this U.S. history AP and the English AP and the this. How much of that do you actually use in college? Yeah, a little. And then you in college, you learn all these classes, organic chemistry. We're so concerned with like, you must learn all these crazy. I, in med school, what organic chemistry did you use? I think probably methyl ethyl isopropyl alcohol. That's about it. <laughs> There's probably nothing else to use from organic chemistry, but you had to do it. And then even in med school, you learn all these different things. Yes, it's important that you're a physician and you know the, how much of that do you use in ophthalmology residency? And no. even the next step, ophthalmology residency, Okay, how much Duane syndrome do I see? How many, how many patients of North Carolina macular dystrophy do I see a year? It starts with a Z and ends with a row, Z row. <laughs> and so even now we're super specialized. So I, at the end of the day, it's more about your personal path and your personal journey than it is about the pit stops or the schools you went to in the past. And so while I'm very proud of my, my alma mater and where I trained and I thought my resident training was great, there's so many other residents under the same program who aren't doing the same thing as me. They found their own path. So I want to encourage all your readers that don't get hung up on where you went to med school. Is it an MD school or a DL school? I'll give you a hint. Doesn't matter. Makes zero difference. And we, if if there are some prejudices against DL graduates, that's nonsense. Utter nonsense. So at the end of the day, really, it's about you and what you want to achieve. And finally, your learning only starts in universities, med schools, residencies, fellowship. That's the beginning. The way I do surgery now is not at all the way I was taught when I was a resident. Not at all. In fact, think about this for something. Some crazy thing I'll tell you. When I did residency, there was no anti-VEGF medicine. Mm. There was no OCT machine. There was no femtosecond laser, no lamellar corneal transplantations, no EDOF extended up the focus IOLs. It just didn't exist. 
So think about this. What I do today is self-taught over the course of the last two decades. So school just gives you the basic tools to think and start on a track. Exactly. Exactly. So school is a good foundation, gives you, it helps you teach yourself. You know, we were talking earlier about ophthalmology residency and for many years, I, I have been affiliated with UCLA for many years. I finished residency there 22 years ago. I stayed on as faculty and I was on a trajectory like I have to achieve assistant professor at 31, associate professor at 37, full professor at 44, and I did it. And chief of ophthalmology at one of their big teaching hospitals. And I did that as well. As of a few months ago, I stepped down from that position and I'm no longer that chief. And I'm just changing gears a little bit. But obviously I still teach every day. If you get a cataract coach video every day, that's me teaching. And I'm not just teaching eight residents a year, which as you know, is a big program. Uh, I'm teaching thousands of ophthalmologists a day. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's really important for you to just not, for you not to be bogged down on the whole concept of, you know, what's important. Is this residency that good? They're all good. It's what you make of it. And how do you make of it in residency? Let's say you start residency and, you know, I've come across some colleagues who have been, uh, who are sort of grieving at this point, not having gone to the residency of their dreams, but still going to a residency. What would you say to those people in terms of using the resources that are there? Great question. And I think the most important thing is to first find a program that fits your personality. And there's no such thing as a right or wrong program for everyone. It's individualized. Same way you choose your friends or your spouse or anyone else in your life. And so if you want to, you want a program, like, and I'll tell you the two questions that I would always ask in residency applicant interviews. Here, these are my absolute two questions. Let me give an incentive for young ophthalmologists or hopeful ophthalmologists to watch this video. Here are the two secret questions I've always asked. Number one, what have you taught yourself outside of medicine in the last few years? It can be anything. And that's important because guess what I do? Every week in my practice, I teach myself. I find something I'm not too familiar with. Let me read about it. I watch other surgeons operate. <clears throat> Yesterday we had a video from Guillermo Amuesca, Amesqua from Vascon Palma, brilliant surgeon. And I loved his video. I learned so much just by watching his video, by editing it, doing the voiceover. So you gotta teach yourself every day the rest of your life. Can you teach yourself? So my interview question is purposeful because show me that, you know what? I learned how to make pasta from scratch by watching YouTube videos. I like it. I learned how to play the guitar. Not that great, but I love it. Or what I do now, if you follow Cataract Coach, I love to ride my mountain bike, but my skill set is still quite in the novice arena. I'm not that good, but I love to watch YouTube videos about mountain biking. I just love it. And so you can teach yourself, especially in this era. So show me you can and, and show me something outside of medicine where you absolutely taught yourself. And the second question I ask, describe to me what you would think would be an amazing day of residency. So you're going home after a, after a long day of, of, the, you know, of your residency program. And on the way home, your commute home, you think, Wow, that was an amazing day of residency. Describe me that program kind of step-by-step, hour-by-hour. And why is that important? Uh, you better be describing our program because that's what I have to offer you. If you're describing a program, well, I like to wake up at about 8 o'clock, have a chai latte, do a little yoga. We'll start a clinic about 9.30, see three or four patients, have a lunch. We'll do the... You're not describing our program. So that question literally is just for you, me to understand what you're like and are you compatible with our program? That's it. And I'll give you one last hint for the, if you have got an interview at a program, they already know you could do on the program. And on the day of interview, it's a, it's a level playing field. You're all capable of being there. Any of the, let's say the program has five spots and they're interviewing 50 or 60 people. Any of those 50 or 60 resident or med students could be a great resident in their program. No question. They just want to find out that are you compatible with their style? And arguably, they're trying to recruit you as much as you're trying to, you know, impress them. Yeah. 
Absolutely right. And I love the explanation about, you know, trying to apply to programs that fit your personality first, as opposed to focusing on, I guess, focusing on their resources that they offer, but you have to be able to get along with the people and picture yourself there. So in this virtual environment, that's quite hard, right? And we don't know who the people are like, and uh, your personality is a rear personality because it's coming across. You don't have like a barrier um, I see, and you're talking from your heart. So how do you recommend maybe programs to kind of open up? Because in some of these interviews, virtual interviews, it's sometimes a little harder to read who these people are. That's a great point. And then I think you're right. Virtual interviews are a little bit tougher for both the interviewer and the interviewee. So both parties have a little bit of a tougher time during the interview of getting across the, the nonverbal body language. And part of the thing is I'm lucky I'm a loud mouth. I talk loudly, so it comes across pretty clearly. But little things like I've got my laptop here raised up at a higher level. And you can, there are videos online where you can look up and people have done the analysis of what's the best angle, what's the, this, just so you put your, come across your, you know, your best self, but you want to come across authentic too. At the end of the day, you just want to be yourself and you want to find the program that really wants you and that you're going to function well there. But again, I, I give you my one little asterisk. I honestly could have done a residency in any program in this country. And I don't think it would make a material difference in the outcome of my life or my career or my passions or projects or anything else. I just don't think it makes that much difference. In fact, joking when patients say, oh, where do you do, where did you do med school? They ask me very rarely, 98% of patients never ask. And the ones that do, I always jokingly say, oh, university internet, home study program. And they laugh a little bit. And I was like, if you really want to know, you can look it up, it's not that hard. But then I said, I'll give them a real answer. But meaning it just doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Now, I'm thankful of those programs. I mean, they they provided great opportunities for me. So I'm, I don't want to come across as, as not thankful. I'm very thankful for my med school, my residency, everything. But that's like it was a great foundation or, or you know, stepping stones to achieve what you need to do in life. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. same way, if someone, if someone asks you, where'd you go to high school? Does that really matter in your career? So it's important that you went to high school somewhere. You took your AP classes. You did well. You graduated with honors. Okay. It doesn't really matter where you went to med school or undergraduate or university either, let me tell you, and residency also. And in fact, look at the most influential ophthalmologists of the last many decades, the ones who had these lifetime achievement awards and Charlie Kelman. Do you know where you went to residency? No, it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter. Choose any ophthalmologist you not today or the last 30, 40 years, whom you think is a very special or accomplished or amazing person, and you don't know where that person did residency because it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I think one of the questions I've always asked is you've, uh, or wanted to ask, is that your father was an ENT and you come from a medical family. And I, I start to wonder, you know, what sort of things that he impart to you um, that prepared you to think this way, to be a self-learner, because w one of the things that I really liked um, in a previous podcast where you mentioned, you know, you went into those suturing um, labs and did suturing on your own, even when suturing. nobody yeah, was, yeah. Yeah. The suturing. yeah, even when you were, you know, not being asked or hold into a number of, you know, student knots or so forth. How did, how did that, uh, like growing up in a family where taking care of people was a responsibility, was a service, how did that influence you? And did that influence you in, in that it's way? A, a, an amazing family. I'm so thankful for that. But, and they obviously taught me throughout my life. But the way I, what I'm doing now is, is I'm marching to my own drum. And so no one told me that. I think in that podcast, I mean, I was a beginning of my med school career, uh, very early in med school. And, you know, there's a patient with a laceration and they said, oh, just your med student, why don't you sew that up? And I sutured it and I had already practiced a lot and it was okay, but it wasn't that pretty. And I was just so disappointed in myself from that, that in med school, I went to the, the laceration room in the emergency room because emergency department has huge laceration. When everyone came with laceration, I just sat there for hours. 
I'd go there on Saturdays and Sundays, you know, first, second year, med school, third year, you know, the, the weekend free. And I just do 10, 12 hours in a row, just suturing one patient after the other, after the other to make it as pretty as I could. And then in med school too, in residency as well, you're in ophthalmology residency and you're on call in one of these hospitals that kind of was so busy, you get called in, you have to see some patient. Like, and I'm on call the whole weekend. I kind of didn't want to go home because if I go home to my little apartment, I just know as soon as I get back in the apartment door, I'm going to get, I'm going to get paged again. I'm just hang out a little bit. So I'd go and I just, I'd, I'd do some reading and catch up on all my reading, the, the basic science books. I'd go to the cafeteria, I'd get like a tomato or a grape or bring it back and they had like an old, you, you know, 30 year old microscope in the back room of the clinic. I'd put the tomato under there and I'd get like a little 10 blade and just cut it. And then I'd get the 10 on nylon out and see if I can just keep suit sewing it back and kind of make it consistent. And that's basically what it took. And then I had my, uh, even for my residents now, not all residents, listen, even in a fancy program like UCLA, where I've taught for 22 years, eight residents a year for 22 years is a lot of residents. Maybe one, maybe two will do what it takes to be really good at suturing. So mo most will not do it. And so I have my recommendation is the 10, 10, 10 rule. That's the cataract coach 10, 10, 10 rule. Can you do 10 sutures of 10 on nylon in 10 minutes? Show me. And most residents won't even put in the effort to try, but a small percent will. So is this a result of the system where we're given this uh, roadmap that at milestone X, you're going to get this at milestone Y, you're going to get this at milestone Z, you're going to get this. And uh, there isn't this promotion of a self-drive of creating um, a path that is untrodden on it, Do you think that that may be a result of that? Or, you know, what, what, what is the reason? It's multifactorial, I'm sure. But, you know, it's, you have to have the drive. Otherwise, you're just not going to achieve it. No one can do it for you. I mean, let's step away from ophthalmology for a second and talk about basketball free throws. Now, in order to be proficient in, in shoot free throws at least a 90% success level, that's a skill that anyone can learn. You can get someone who's naturally talented and maybe they get to 90% of basketball free throw ability within a week. It may take me a year. There's a varying degree. But if I really want to, I promise I can achieve it. No question. It's only a matter of how hard I work. So yes, there's natural innate ability, but working incredibly hard at that skill, it does make a huge difference. And you'll see that with the residents. Some residents in the, can their initial test of the IC simulator, they'll do better than others. But if you give them time and they really put in the effort, the end of the, the thing, the most important factor is who's practiced the most. Hmm. And we also need to take a step back. I think we're making, doing a big disservice to everyone by making life pass fail in our academic institutions or even worse, pass now, pass later, there is no fail. That's a new one that's coming, you'll be surprised. Or taking away honors or, or uh, honor societies, I, I, I'm kind of old fashioned. If I need to have my own eye surgery or brain surgery or heart surgery, I just want the surgeon who's the most talented. And I don't mind age, gender, any other factor you want. It doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you have tattoos on your neck. It makes no difference. In fact, one of my best scrub techs has neck tattoos, tattoos all over it. And you would think, oh, that person seems, that person's amazing. Do not let that bias you. Base it on skill. And finally, the ultimate test in life is, I have never met a patient in my life who's a doctor for my surgery, just do a passable job. Pass is okay. <laughs> Every patient wants perfection. Like literally the patient is going to be 2020. I know it's 2020, doctor, but when's it going to be really sharp? Or their post-op refraction, they start off at minus 20 or minus 10 and post-op, and they're like, well, why is it not zero? And so that, that's, that's really, really something unfortunate that patients, uh, you know, patients expect perfection. We need to be able to deliver it. So my advice is hold yourself to a higher standard and give, put all the effort and give all the full effort because your patients are going to demand it. So the real um, 
people giving the grades are the patients. And they're perhaps the most keen on making sure that you get the perfect grade. So that's the perspective that I think is missing in today's uh, education. I think we're so focused on what administration wants. We forget that this is perhaps the lowest level of proficiency we will need to get when in actuality, the uh, patient is the one who supersedes what even our administration expects out of us, whether that is in an educational environment or in a work environment. You're, you're absolutely correct. Um, where is that transition, I guess, when we suddenly realize that this is what we need to achieve? These are the people that we need to please and make sure that they are happy. Because when we go into medicine, we go into a service industry in, in that respect. Remember that your patients are going to see the world every waking moment for the rest of their lives. That's how critically important the surgery is. So you have to hold yourself to a higher standard and really aim to deliver incredible outcomes for your patients. You can't say, well, I had an off day, it didn't go so well, or I really didn't practice that technique much. Sorry, I capsule broke and sulcus lens and vitreous traction and chronic macular edema and 20 out of 200 vision. That doesn't work. And so you really have to hold yourself to a much higher standard. And in that regard, keep in mind that your residency and fellowship training is just the beginning. And remember, too, in the U.S., we have a shorter training program. I just returned from speaking at the Royal College of Ophthalmology meeting, which was this year in Scotland. Fantastic time meeting great young doctors. In the U.K., they're doing seven years of ophthalmology training after what we would consider an internship. Seven. In the U.S., we're doing an internship plus three more, a total of four. They may be doing a total of up to nine years for the same training. And while in the U.S., you know, most programs finish with 100, 150 cataracts and that whole program, these guys are routinely doing 600, 800, 1,000 cataracts. And okay. so, you, yeah, just keep in mind, even compared to the world stage, our U.S. training, which you achieve in your residency fellowship, just the beginning. Yeah. And, you know, this is something that having talked with other global leaders and educators, it's dawned on me that we live in this small sphere, pre, pre-COVID at least. You have probably gotten uh, exposure to all these educational environments uh, much before. So, you know, what impact does that have on you as you're teaching and building videos from Cataract Coach? Well, I want to deliver the highest level so I can teach the highest level. In Cataract Coach, I give away every single secret, pearl, tip, trick, technique that I've learned in the last 20 plus years. I give it all away. I hold nothing back. And that's the nice part about it. Learning from the videos can compress your surgical learning curve. Good example is a video I showed it two weeks ago about phaco wound burns, corneal wound burns. And I had a video sent in by a resident who said, you know, I'd seen your previous video about phaco wound burns. And I was starting my own cataract case, case number 100 or so. And at the tip of the phaco probe, I see what looks like white smoke, which is, of course, just lens of material that's emulsified or pulverized, but not aspirated because the, the, the needle throat is blocked. And he said, I immediately saw that. I came out of the eye. And lo and behold, I flushed the tip. It was clogged. And then I did the case normally. If he, says, I, he said, if I hadn't seen your video, I would have for sure burned that cornea. And that gives the patient 13, 14 diopters of irregular stigmatism for life. Yet that was prevented because his learning curve was compressed. He was able to see and understand and recognize and learn from a complication before it ever happened to him. And then that's the neat part about this. Another good example is my good friend, Ramesh Ayala, who's an incredible ophthalmologist, chairman of University of South Florida ophthalmology department. He has multiple videos on cataract coach of how to treat or drain expulsive choroidal hemorrhages. Gosh, knock on wood, I've never had one. But if I do, I've watched his video many times. I know exactly what he would do. And he is the expert because yeah. they get referred into him from all around the community. So learning from videos is a very important part of that. And it's just making the commitment. The reason why I do cataract coach in five or so minute videos, one video a day, 
it's just for me that works the best. I can't sit there and watch hours and hours of video. I just can't. I like, give me five minutes and give me just like one bit of it every single day. Yeah. And then over the course of a year, wow, it's a tremendous amount of learning. And right, we're up to almost 1,500 videos on Cataract Coach, a new one still every single day. A great, a great feat indeed. And one of the things that, you know, I started doing in podcasting is, you know, taking ownership of the audios that I've been doing on my own. And it's just so hard to give all of this work to somebody else. And you're the same in that respect, right? Like you do the videos yourself, you do the editing, you do the explanation and it takes so much time, but it is a pleasure because you're putting out quality content that you know that you've listened to or seen several, several times before you've eventually published it. Yeah, absolutely. And the amount of work it takes is tremendous. I mean, I'm a busy guy. I already have a lot, a lot of stuff going on in my life. You know, I do my private practice. I had academic work. I have a lens cal company. We do this accompanying IOL company. I've got a lot of projects going on. Plus, as usual, like anyone else, I got a personal life and family life and other yeah, everything else. But to just ask yourself, how long would it take you to make one video? You got to make a title slide. Put the fonts on there. You've got to um, edit the video down because no one wants to watch a 45 minute routine case. Edit down to five minutes. Put it all together in an editing program. Put the text over on the, te on, the, on the video. Now record a voiceover. Now sync them together. Now render the MPEG-4 file. Now upload the file, including the title page. And then choose the date up to, that'll be released on YouTube or on Cataract Coach. Write the text for it. It's a lot more work than you think. Mm -hmm. If you can do all that in two hours, I'm impressed. So now multiply that by 1,500 videos. That's 3,000 hours. That's no shortage of work. Yeah. So yeah. If you're watching. Uh, uh, you're, you're watching. It takes two hours of labor a day. It's three. It's 14 hours a week of labor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the catch for all this stuff. It's all about content. If I don't have new content, you're going to lose interest. Yeah. So I got to have new content every day. That's the and other. Now yeah. Now we're going into the next level. Now I have a, even my monthly column, I've been writing a column in OctoCert News. It used to be called Back to Basics. Now it's more Cataract Coach. We're writing that every month for the last 17 years. I'm on column number 200. Every month for 200 months. And it, like, I guess I saw you at the Millennium Line meeting in, in Austin, Texas. Cataract Coach sessions now at the meetings. Yeah. And you start my session. I'm not playing for second place. I got to win. I got to like, I got to wow the crowd. And it was truly incredible. I absolutely love that session. Yeah. So, it's, so that's what I want to do. I want to give the kind of the video or talk that I'd want to hear. And I'm my own toughest credit. Believe me, no one's tougher on me than me. And I think that's what helps me achieve so much. So, so how do you like get that time to do all of this? I feel like you've started so many things at some period of time, right? And you've continued them. That's the, that's the key. Like you've continued all of these activities, but how did you have time as you've gotten more and more things you've added to your portfolio? There's a saying, if you want to get something accomplished, ask someone who's busy. When you ask someone who's busy, that person just knows how to get, they're busy because they know how to get things done. You email me out of the blue. Do I have time for this? So at the first, I got to check. I got to guess. Okay, let me look a little bit. Let me look at your previous podcast. That takes some time. All right, let's, just, let's do this. I think it'll be a fun thing to do. We'll get the message out. I think it's an important message to be learned. And um, okay, let's do it. And then just schedule it. Listen, Google Calendar. And I got no financial interest in Google, but Google Calendar. I mean, you can, you can arrange everything. You arrange your whole life on it. Mm -hmm. And then everything that I have that's a to-do, uh, my email inbox, it's labeled the big red to-do. And my goal is always like, how many of these red to-dos can I kill off today? <laughs> that's it. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's what I enjoy. It's all, it's, I could stop any of this, but I'm enjoying it. And that shows. Yeah. You know, I was, yeah, I was, listen, I, was in, I was in Scotland last week and on Monday, which is like my big OR day, I thought, God, it's Monday. I kind of wish I was doing surgery. <laughs> it's just kind of, but that just, that's my personality. And I love, I love, love, love what I do. Yeah. 
which country has probably told i know a lot of countries have taught you quite a bit and you didn't go through fellowship you actually created a fellowship for yourself through these international and national experiences so which place um has taught you the most and perhaps changed the way that you've seen um how your life should function as a surgeon as a person as a family man and so forth that's a great question so you know, very fortunate and very happy that I didn't waste a year or two of my life doing a fellowship, which would not have really applied to what I do now. Now, listen, if I want to do vitro retinal surgery, I should have done a two-year fellowship in vitro surgery. Same with orbital surgery. Same argument if I want to be a strabismus specialist, do a one-year PEATS fellowship. But do I really need to do that fellowship when I, I'm, what I love is cataract? No. And even if I did a cornea fellowship back 22 years ago, first at the time it was two years long and there was no OCT machine of the cornea. There was no lamellar transplantation, no femtosecond laid. Seriously? You would have had to talk to yourself this anyway. So I don't mind. I'm, I go head to head with anyone who's done a fellowship who thinks they're better. It's, it's, we're all the same. We're all in the same boat together. Mm-hmm. It's what do you want to achieve and how hard do you want to, to work to, to achieve it? I think more than a specific country, there are people that I learned from. And there's some amazing people, probably one of the most amazing is Bob Osher. Oh, Bob Osher is, 20 years ago, I'd be traveling to all the international meetings to do live surgery events and talk, and talk on the podium. And I'd always make it a point, if the ESCRS was in Lisbon, Portugal that year, or the APACRS was in, you know, Singapore, I'm going. And I'm going to go, and I always figure out where's Osher's course, and I always attend it. Because he's the godfather of video. I'm merely his disciple. And so he started off, I mean, I watched his videos as a, as a resident. I used to go borrow the VHS tapes. But now we're able to like see things stream, stream them live. And so I, I don't want to supplant him. I want to take it from what he's taught me and do my own thing. But he has so much to teach, such a brilliant man. And so he taught me, and he also taught me about life. There's a book that Osha wrote. There are two books of Osha you have to get. I have no financial interest in anything. One is called, called What I Say. And it's, it's, it's uh, Jack Parker and, and Bob Osher writing a book. And I reviewed, on, I reviewed the video already on Cataract Coach. If you, look, if you look it up, look up Osher on cataractcoach.com and you'll see that it's there, my review of the book. The book's incredible because it teaches you how he talks to patients. And that's an incredible skill. The second book that Osher wrote is The ABCs of ophthalmology and of life. And he explains all these things and getting a balance in your life and what's important to you. And, and there's certain times that, you know, you really need to prioritize one thing over the other. And then finally to understand that in ophthalmology, I don't need to be, or I don't want to be a Bob Osher or Dick Lindstrom or a Don Unfeld, all great people. I've learned from each of them, but they're them, I'm me. I can just do me. And that's a big revelation. You know, if we're all in Hollywood, for this example, you know, Brad Pitt and, and um, uh, Brad Pitt and Jim Carrey are not going after the same roles. They're not in competition with each other. In the same way, I'm, I'm only in competition with me. I want to see how much better can I be than me. And so understand that everyone has their own role. And some people are better at certain skills. Some people are better at others. That's okay. You be you. And so having that peace really helps me a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I know you, you really look up to Dr. Bog Yosher and how he has really taught you with his videos. Um, and now those videos are in iTube, which is great. Um, but at your time, you really had to go through the whole searching aspect and getting them so there's a level of perseverance that began at a very very young age and it showed and you know now we have everything at our fingertips through the internet and so it should be easier but there's a challenge now and the challenge now arguably is information overload right the paradox of choice for if you if people always talk about Mm-hmm. But even for cataract coaches, if you're watching my videos only on YouTube, you're actually losing out because there's actually more material on the actual website, cataractcoach.com. And I will be the first to tell you with almost 1,500 videos, it can be a little daunting finding what you want. 
Yeah. Which is why on the Cataract Coach website, the search engine is much better than the YouTube search engine. And then also starting in July, I'm going to have a new feature for Cataract Coach, which is, I can have a, an announcement here. No one's known this yet. It's going to be the Cataract Coach curriculum. So all these videos, well, where do I start? I'm a first year resident, PGY1, postgraduate year one. It's July. Okay, I want to learn. Where do I start? Or I'm a PGY2 resident now, PGY3. What video should I watch in what order? What's to give me a curriculum? It's common. I'm so excited about that. And in fact, that was one of my questions I had, you know, creating a fellowship for yourself through all these people, all these wonderful experiences. How do you start? How do you have the find the resources? And one of the things that is so hard for someone as a trainee and aspiring ophthalmologist is asking the right questions. And maybe that's where a mentor is really important. And um, Bobby Usher was that mentor for you. But how did yeah, you yeah. how did you get like the intuition to ask the right questions and grappling on to things that ended up working out? Were there any failures in your life that maybe taught you more from from that experience and allowed you to be a better surgeon? Well, I'm an expert at making mistakes. But I'm also an expert at having the grit and tenacity to overcome them, to recover, to learn from them. Mistake versus a lesson, you learn from the lessons. So let's make, every, make sure everything is a lesson in life. For Osher, a brilliant guy, I just naturally love this stuff. And when I was a, a resident, I, yeah, I would borrow these VHS tapes, which were at best in S video, which is for pixel wise, 640 by 480. And oftentimes they were less than that because they were copied or whatever else. And I just learned so much from those that anytime I was at an academy or like an Asian meeting or a European meeting, and he was speaking also, and he spoke at essentially all of them, I'd always attend his course and always sit in the front row in about the same seat. And it was like maybe three or four countries. And he's like, you, you're following me. I see you all over the world. You follow me in every country I go to. He says, what's your name? And we start talking. And he said, I just love to learn from you. And so, and this, I didn't have his email or his cell phone or anything else now. No, I just, I just enjoyed learning from him. He had an infectious enthusiasm, a zest for wanting to learn. And the best of all, and a humbleness to him. He is such a master surgeon, but he's just so kind, unassuming, you'd never know. That's really nice. The, the sweetest guy. Yeah, you got to see his two books. What I say, and then the ABCs. And they're both of you can just look at Robert H. Osher is the author. I'm sure you can find it on Amazon or wherever else. Google it. I will. I will. And I always like people who are really down to earth because it keeps you connected with your patient population, which is the people you meet every day. Right. Um, in, I guess in, in, in another question I had following up is, you know, going back to it's the horse uh, that not the racetrack. When we talk about entering ophthalmology or applying for ophthalmology, how is it that, um, you know, how do you recommend people to prepare and get yourself noticed? If you're not being noticed, how do you overcome that, right? Like, um, and I guess that's where the debate between MD and DO or IMGs comes up too. How do you tell these people to... Um, continue being somebody that you envision. Maybe you don't have that guarantee, but this is what you want to go into. You know, I don't know if I have a, a correct answer for this. And certainly I think the best is to ask the people who know you who are at your program, who can give you a little bit better guidance. But in general, have the drive, the tenacity, the I am going to achieve this. And I always think, Anytime I have a failure, hey, no problem. That's just one step closer to success. I'll take it. Next, what did I learn from it? Let's recognize we can react to it and recover from it. Now let's reorganize and let's reapply. Let's do it. And there's no harm in that. And it's a different environment now. I think it's a, it's a, that's why you should ask the people you work with in your program. Because when I give you advice, it was when, when I did 20 years ago, more, it was, it, I applied to, 15 programs, interviewed a 13 and got lucky and you know, matched up my number one program. And so maybe there's some luck involved there. But 
I think now people are applying to 70, 80, 90, 100 programs. I don't know if that benefits anyone other than the SF match people who charge you more money per application. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, you're you're saying the words of wisdom here, and it's it's something that I think you know very few have mentioned. So, it, what I've found from speaking with other people is that you have to know yourself, and you have to um, get people seeing you in action, so that there is this personal connection of them knowing you and you knowing them. And like you said in a previous you know statement about um, you have to get along with the people. You have to have that personality mix with the residency individuals. So it's it's hard sometimes with this environment when you're applying to so many and you have no direction as to who is going to pick. So then it, it is more kind of a luck where you applied to 15, got into 13. I think that's more of like a a, a calculated decision that I know these programs. I know if, that I'm a good applicant for them and it worked out. But then now it's quite different where I guess most of us are being focused on applying to as many as we can and hoping that we would have a luck of the draw and get as many as possible, which is interesting. Well, now with the interviews that are kind of being done on, on Zoom and their fixed number of times or interviews, you can't basically can't uh, you can't interview at seventy programs. Yeah. Even if you were such an incredible applicant that every program you applied to gave you an interview, you couldn't fit seventy in your schedule. Mm-hmm. So I think what would make more sense is if the if we limited the number of programs you could apply to. So then the applicant could self limit the program, so you don't the program don't have to guess. So if the program says, "Well, this pro this applicant's probably not going to come here." Well, why do they make the program do that? Why don't you just have the applicant do that? And I think the one thing is, I think the problem is that the one glaring problem is the SF match is getting paid per application, per program. Mm-hmm. That's a lot. So why do they want, they don't want you to apply to just 20. They want you to apply to 80. Yeah. yeah. It's four times as much. But if you took that out of the equation, you said each applicant can apply to only 25 programs or 30 programs, something more reasonable. Mm-hmm. It helped the programs because you cut down on the number of applications you have to review. Right. In the old days, you would cut down applications often based on okay, I mean, uh, on USMLE step one scores. Mm-hmm. Well, the scores are gone. Okay, you could do it based on grades. Well, from most many schools, grades are gone. You could do it based on AOA. In fact, the, the application for ophthalmology right, still asked, "Are you AOA? Junior, senior? Did not get, not offered mm-hmm. my school." Well, now more and more schools are saying, "No, no more AOA." We don't believe in, we don't believe in that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But then how do you want me to, 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 to kind of judge people based that there are no scores, there are no grades, there's no honor societies. The letters of rec look very similar. Mm-hmm. Personal statements look very similar too. Mm-hmm. I don't know what's left. Yeah. I think about this. I mean, because if I only have some, because now if you look at a big program, a big program may get 400 to 500 applications for 40 to 50 interview spots. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you choose? How do you choose who to interview? I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. And then the other thing is, who's gatekeeping this? Meaning, who, are there are there people who are gatekeeping, meaning like, of our incoming class, we want to have this kind of check boxes checked and this kind of makeup of the this and that. Really? Are they, should they be gatekeeping it? The more you move away from actual, from, from, from merit-based, then the gatekeepers get to decide, well, who is qualifies to check off this box versus the other box versus the other. And I don't know. At the end of the day, that's why I say, don't get caught up in this. Any program you go to is perfectly fine. And the biggest idols in life, in ophthalmology, you don't even know where they did residency, let alone med school. Yeah. And you have so much virtual lessons now, which is great. And I think what happened post-COVID is that most people have now started finding mentors outside of their home institute as well, rather than lamenting over the fact that they're in a specific region and they can't learn certain things from you know other institutes. I think there's a quite a bit of cross-institutional collaborations now 
Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it, it was there before, but it's definitely publicized more now. Yeah. Listen, go to the beat, march to the beat of your own drummer. Do things your way. Don't give up. Be tenacious. Have that grit. You can achieve any of this. And at the end of the day, I promise, I'm not a residency snob. It doesn't matter where you went to residency. It really doesn't, right? It's, it's the chef, not the kitchen that makes you dinner, right? <laughs> Another good example. Good chef, I can cook in any kitchen. Yeah. Then you want to just, you keep, you got to be your own toughest critic. Make sure you get better every case. Even mm-hmm. if you're in a great, an amazing residency program by all standards. Okay. They're still not going to make you learn. You you can't go there with a blank slate and say, okay, I'm here. Teach on me. Go ahead. Just pour it on. No. I've got to actively incorporate this information into my knowledge. When I'm operating in learning category, case 22, 23, 24, 25, they better each go 23, 4, 5, 6, not across and flat and no progress made. You've got to learn from every case. Mm -hmm. So it blows my mind. I've had residents where I ask, well, you don't have a USB stick in the microphone. You're not recording the video. No. Nah. What? Do you not want to learn from your own surgeries? Do you not have that drive to be better and better and better and better? Yeah. The, the diploma you get from the residency doesn't make, that's not what does the surgery. It's you. It's what experience you got out of the purpose of residency is to squeeze every bit of knowledge, experience, and hands-on that you can out of those few years. hmm and while we're on the subject, let me be a heartbreaker and tell you a harsh truth that no one realizes when they're in their training. I'll be the first to admit I was so stupid, so naive. When I was a senior resident, I said to myself, I said, oh, I can't wait till I'm in private practice. It'll be so much easier. <laughs> How crazy is that? It's only harder. That's like you saying 11th grade was really hard. Yeah, at the time it was hard, but now it's like a walk in the park. So when you're in practice, you look back at a residency. It's like I used to think residency was hard when I was, when I was a resident. But now looking back, what an easy life it was. With the real world is so much harder. Mm-hmm. No attending sitting next to you to bail you out of the surgery. No one to be able to ask questions to. All the problems are yours. If you're doing private practice, you got to run a business and to your patients. Any problem that happens in your clinic is your fault now all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Now you've got to worry about the patients, how they rate you online. It, poof. Yeah. So That's enjoy your cool. residency, but it's going to be one of the most fun, most enjoyable. Yes, you'll work hard, but in the scope of your life, it'll be the easy years. Thank you, Dr. Devgan. And I have to say, this was a very heart to heart conversation. I got to learn so much from you. And it's it's true, you know, after getting that diploma, what do you do then, Right. Um, are you comfortable with getting out to the real world? I don't think that ever happens. I think you have to keep on hustling and seeing where the times are changing and how to best adapt. And it's harder in a private practice because there's no one telling you how the times are changing. I can't imagine uh, you know, anyone better than you explaining that. So thank you so much for being sure. on this podcast. And you know, I think uh, we got a new news for Cataract Coach. And a new I, curriculum coming. And yeah. I'll, I'll leave you with one really poignant thought. And that's first, remember, anyone can be a professor. To profess means to teach. You don't have to be academic affiliated. In fact, m- most of my important teachings are non-academic affiliated. So don't get too caught up in that either. But the one goal, the one thing I can leave you with, and one of the secrets to my success is, I, for every surgery I do, I'm giving the same high level of care that I'd want as if it was my own eye, everything. From the consultation to the lens calculations to every single step of surgery, even the draping, the, I want to give the same high level treatment that I want to receive. And by holding myself to that higher metric, higher standard, we're really able to deliver incredible ac- uh, accuracy and excellence for our patients. Very true. All right. We'll catch you up in later episodes, hopefully. All right. Sounds like a plan. Take care now.